Another matchup of game gods, tacticians divine. Freddy Babes and Jora, there's real coin on the line. There's real coin on the line. There's real coin on the line. Alright, my friends, we're getting into the back half of today's quarterfinal matchups. Freddy Babes taking on Jora. Both champions in their own right. Uh, Jora did get the runner up in Gwent Open number one. One of the earlier tournaments, Freddy Babes got as two uh, tournaments under his belt here with Gwent Slam number two and Gwent Open number two. So, a formidable opponent on either side of the board here. Really excited to see how this one's going to pan out. Outstanding performance by Freddie Babes in regular tournaments. He's just so consistent as a player and has defeated extremely good players on top of that, being able to defeat Tailbot 3-0 in the Gwent Open number two, as he's going to face off against Jora, who we have not heard about much lately, mm -hmm. but he's definitely been practicing a lot. I have got the pleasure of meeting him. He's such a nice guy. You know, I got to you know, repeat what Matthew said, said there. And I'm very excited to see if Jora, you know, his training with Team Aretuza, his scrims with him is going to pull out today as he's facing one of the top competitors in one. Yeah, don't let the don't let the number of place and matches fool you. He does scrim a lot and scrimming mm -hmm. is usually when you can really hone your matchup uh, your matchups and really kind of develop uh, some interesting deck strategies that you can just try over and over and over again. So he believes in a lot of value in scrims, and I'm sure he's not the only one at the tournament that believes that. Freddy Babes is a very well-rounded player, of course, tournament winner, does scrim a lot, uh, does do a lot of planning, and he plays a lot on the pro ladder as well. So very well-rounded experience from Freddy. Uh, but I think, yeah, I think we would say that this is kind of a dark horse matchup for Jora. So we're looking forward to seeing how Jora's going to match up here against a very tough opponent in Freddy Babes. Yeah, this is perhaps the matchup in which uh, one of the players is the most favored, and that is Freddy Babes, but that always leaves room for the surprise, and Dark Horse is an excellent term. Jora, do not underestimate him. We're taking a look at the lineups right now. A mere ban from Freddy, but for the first time ever, the Epera has been set free as Freddy has opted to ban Hensold, which is not a crazy ban by all means. A lot of players are slowly speculating that Hensold may be the most powerful leader in this kind of format because you know when you're going second and Hensold is super devastating when going second so uh, I like that approach from Freddy, the first player to actually not ban Emir in this tournament as we're actually going to see Nilfgaard Spies in action and that makes me very happy. For sure Nilfgaard Spies, uh, you know, for a long time, at least for the last two pro seasons, has been dominating the ladder, considered a, to a top tier deck for a very long time, very refined at this point. Uh, you know, it's been very similar deck for a very long time. It's very efficient. The use of enforcers for control and the use of emissaries to basically uh, make it very, very difficult to ever draw badly, as you can always thin your deck. But we're not talking about Nilfgaard here because we're going to go into a Skellige versus Northern Realms matchup. We're going to see Hensold, and we're going to see how tough it is to beat Hensold here. Because you are right, Hensold is, uh, uh, the word I've been using a lot, is abusive when you get to go second. He's just mm -hmm. so strong. Not surprised at all. It, it, it's important to note that while well, I've been praising Hensold, uh, Freddy himself is running Radovid in his own lineup, so it's going to be interesting to see his uh, Radovid. Mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of his Radovid deck. He's always been showcasing off cool cards, you know, like Lambert and uh, the Mac Ale. He was like the first one to introduce that in the tournament with Silda Tanzerville, but we do see, uh, sorry, we're seeing Radovid from Freddy Babes. Mm -hmm. uh, we got that wrong. Radovid versus Croc on Crate. So yeah, this this is uh, Freddy Babes' Radovid list, which is a pretty, it's kind of like a, it seems like a hybrid between musters and machines. So he does. He is running battering rams, siege towers, and also one copy of uh, the reinforced ballista. But also combining that with the likes of uh, blue stripe scouts, which is also a crewman. So it, there is synergy there. It's perhaps the most unique northern realm list that I've seen in this tournament. Up, you know, up to this point. But we're also seeing great source from Jora. This list. It's actually the one that Shaggy utilized in the Gwen Slam prior, as it is running Avalok and Renew, which has the potential to mill Freddy. You a quick deal. Yeah, I mean, Avalok and Renew can really punish a thinning and efficient deck, much like Freddy Babe's Northern Realms here, as we see him lead off with the Blue Stripes Scout, you know, the standard Temerian package of Blue Stripes Scout, Blue Stripes Commando, and Temerian Infantry uh, being exceptionally thinning and very strong as well, if you're able to execute here. Jorah denying the Blue Stripes Scout, preventing Freddy Babe's from using the Reaver Scout to source an additional one. 
making it just a little bit harder for him to get through his deck. Freddy Babes, we've seen a lot of interesting stuff from Freddy Babes deck, but I would say that this is probably one of the safest lists he's brought to a tournament recently. Yes. And there's a lot of money on the line, I don't blame him, but he is running Dijkstra in Blue Dream, which can come out creative ways to win. To That's how I feel it's lost. Because he utilized the uh, the Borfer Counter, he's going to force reinforcement out of uh, John Natalis to get the Elf second Blue Stripe die. Scout, denying a potential reinforcement into Ronvit instead. So very nice play by Jorah there. A very straightforward play in this matchup if you do have a unit that deals four damage because you also prevent potential buffs. And that put Jorah in a very not solid position. But this John Natalis play does provide Freddy Base with quite a bit of tempo and puts him 15 points ahead. Yeah, strong stuff in tournaments here when you have cards that just kind of really line up in the matchup, the Brockfar Hunter being able to deny the Blue Stripe Scout, just making things just a little bit harder for Freddy to execute his strategy. But here he does have the Scout that has stuck, which means the Reaver Scout does have a home. Not necessarily the play, but probably um, what's going to go on here. I'm great. Take that advantage. The great sword hitting down right next to the Board Park Hunter. He's probably going to follow that up with the Light Longship to the left. And I'm going to start to produce the... Uh, go, go the One of the things about Avalok as well is that not only can it potentially mill the opponent, but it also prolongs a round, which is something this deck really wants because the longer the round, the more potential growth the Clan and Clay Greatsword has. And that's one of the things that Shaggy took out of his lineup because people would uh, he, he expected people to play around Avalok more and opt to go with Vesemir instead. But Avalok could be tremendous, even if Freddy does see it coming. It's hard not to be vulnerable to it, especially with this kind of Northern Realm list. Great Sword Engine is something that is tough to stop in a long round, and being able to prolong that round is a huge deal. Freddy not opting to play the Reaver Scout, believing that that Scout is, uh, the Blue Stripe Scout, is very safe at this point. Should get around to getting to that maybe in the next couple of turns, just to get that thinning out as Jorah is setting up that snowball-y Great Sword, as it will continue to get pinged and grow every two turns, making for a great resurrection target late in round three, and also pushing this round along and keeping, uh, keeping pace. There goes the Light Long Ship hitting the Clown and Clay Greatsword and also buffing the Hunter in the process. The engine is set in motion and there's more components to it. The thing is he... That Jong is going to be very key, but I think he's, he may have to develop the likes of the Greatsword to the, right next to the Hunter, so that way he can play Janga and actually get some nice swings going on for him. He has a lot of potential for, uh, you know, tempo plays, even though this deck has a little bit of a, perhaps a slow start. But Croc can mitigate that, and Avalok can also pull. I believe he's running Roach in this deck, if I'm not mistaken. He is. So Avalok is a 12-point play that will also prolong the round. So this is looking very nice for Jorah, as Freddy Babes mm. does also have quite the options. And yeah. he's going to have to go with Shift his answer mate. here. Rattle right it to deny the long ship and the sword. Great sword. Yeah, I was going to actually ask you when when you decide to go for Radovid here, but this is, you know, you yeah. get two great targets here. The long ship is shut down, the great sword is shut down. Jora needs to establish those pieces all over again. Uh, he doesn't have the Heimei Battle Maiden. He is running two in his deck, but he isn't able to source an additional long ship at this point. He may opt to play Avalok sooner rather than later just to increase his odds of getting that engine to be reestablished. Uh, at which point Freddy would either, you know, Freddy might try to out-tempo it, um, but yeah, the risk of having that renew Ava lock, it's tough, right? You don't want to end up with a dead Dijkstra, you don't want to end up with, uh, you know, a dead Reaver Scout in some situations. Probably not in this situation. Is George just Force getting out of his round? Pass. The goes. tempo was too big, and he's, he, that route of it, even though it was early on, it was perfect because it, it denied the growth, and now he's at the hands of Freddy. This is not good for Jorah at all. Being this this kind of deck needs a long round, so if if Freddy can find a way to kind of like divide both rounds and try to negate the value from uh, Greatsword, that could put him in a very bad spot. You know, it, it's it's definitely it's gonna be very interesting to see because he still has an answer for it. Margarita, Margarita can deny another Greatsword from start growing, and that. Yes, he has other options. He can resurrect others or he can search for others through the deck, but it slows down the process, and that's very, very bad news for Jorah. I mean, the cool thing about Radovid, and this is something that Freddy Babes believes because he does bring Radovid to these tournaments, one of the best things about Radovid, especially when you add Margarita into the list, is the shutdown potential in almost any matchup. In this situation, you shut down the Greatsword and the Longships. Should this have been Unseen Elder, uh, you can shut down Necris, you can shut down Vrans uh, in, some, in some of the lineups, and Nilfgaard, you can shut down the Enforcers uh, in a lot of situations. So it's like Radovid having that control over proactive strategies like Greatsword and, you know, like Enforcers, like Neckers, is... Uh, uh, it's very, very strong in a tournament setting, and you take that option when you just know you can get a decent matchup out of your leader. 
this also this is a little bit awkward though for Freddy because the question is who wins in a very long round because I, I would argue that uh, Great Swords is more powerful if the round is, is wrong is long eno enough especially with the likes of Avalok you know the ability to constantly be buffing up your unit again and again the longer the round is the more powerful that's going to be but we see Olderic in the hand of Jora so if Jora can generate enough tempo advantage over Freddy I and will he can off three look for that opening he can play the spy to stop the bleeding from continuing. But the thing is, Jorah is kind of interested in getting bled, if that makes any sense, because he needs to focus on growing his late game res. Like right now, he doesn't have a good res target, uh, or at least a very impactful one. So it's going to be interesting to see exactly when Freddy Babes opts to pass. And we see him ultra life coach mode right now, super concentrated, thinking just about that. We're talking about that tunnel vision thing you can <laughs> see on the on Freddy Babes screen right here. Watch the focus. You try to shut down the world around you so you can focus on the game. It's a pretty good tactic. A lot of players do it. Uh, either either they they, you know, do? they don't know they're doing it sometimes, but they definitely do it. As Freddy Babes shuts down another component of the engine for Jora. And what I've got my eyes on Avalok though. At what point is he going to show Avalok in this situation? It's not surprising for Greatsword because of everything you said, Miguel, about the long round. Mm -hmm. But the renew might actually catch for, catch Freddy off guard. So I think I think Avalok is very much justified here. Yep. Because it gets Roach out of the deck, and you also have renew. So I, as you said, even though you you're revealing it, and Freddy may try to adapt to that. It's also difficult because that means you have to play suboptimally, and that's not something that you can afford when you need to get one card out of your opponent. Freddy, because of his past and because of the fact you know that Jorah went second, he has to get that extra card out of him, which means he has to create enough of a gap to uh, get ahead of Jorah and put him in that spot. But that's going to be even harder when you draw the second the very infantry bet. Yeah. Because of Avalok, great Avalok there. Early Avalok against Northern Realms can also be very disruptive as well. You could have made a case to make play Avalok a little bit earlier. Like mm -hmm. It wouldn't have necessarily surprised Freddy Babes to see Avalok in Greatsword, but to really kind of screw the draws up with Demarian Infantry, Blue Stripes Commando. Uh, but I think this is still pretty good. He does make Freddy Babes' hand a little bit harder to navigate, maybe actually forces him to opt to pass earlier than he maybe would have considered pushing. Uh, also, Jorah's hand is pretty good. Three Freyas right now, he'd be able to get a great third back out. He has a light long ship in hand as well. He is able to set up, uh, you know, it's a little slow, but he is, you know, now is the best time to try to set this up again. Jorah's in a position where he absolutely has to win. I wonder if Udalric is a liability at this point, though. Well, it's, it's good to have it in hand. Like, because of how many cards he has in hand, it's not really a liability because he can afford to really prolong the round up to a point in which he can create that gap to play it. And because he's already disrupted uh, Freddy's game plan a little bit with that double Terminator infantryman uh, having it in hand, like, Freddy is vulnerable. If Freddy were to draw into immediately into, like, a third infantryman, it would be Shaggy with the Crones all over again. And uh, nobody wants that. No, definitely not Freddy. Except That's, for Jura. <laughs> yeah, Jura would love that, actually. That would be the best thing. Uh, because, you know, what Demarian is Infantry is quite a strong finisher. Uh, definitely a huge tempo play when you really want to pressure your opponent uh, in this situation. So he's just, and you know, it, nothing just really sucks. Not only when you play that stuff, when you play when you have two Temerian Infantry in hand, it feels bad because you're not getting the full value out of the bronze, but you're also letting your opponent know, hey, my hand's not very good. And that's, you know, that's the kind of information that you definitely don't want your opponent to have. Exactly. His, Freddy's hand is rather awkward because he does have Shani, but you don't, you want to kind of preserve Shani for round three. And it's, I'm, it's not clear just how far you can push. And it's not clear to me if he can actually generate that strength gap to get that extra card out of Jorah, especially when Jorah has not wasted his croc on crate yet. And croc on crate will pull out John Gaffret from the deck, which is going to provide him with a very powerful swing that's going to be go beyond 20 points and further. Jorah set up the Brockfire Hunter here on the other side of the on crate Greatsword, which is uh, what you would do, locked or not locked. And I'm actually interested if uh, Jorah wants to set up uh, you know what, I'm going to maybe not say that because that's probably not what Jorah's going to think about, but it's uh, the point of where Jorah is thinking about probably playing uh, Priestess of Freya to get another, to get a greatsword that can work out. Uh, he's thinking about the longship. You know, he did exactly what I thought I was, I was going, this is what I was going to say he was going to do and I thought he wouldn't do it, but he did do it. He set the ship up now, he's going to get the buff, and at this point he can resurrect the, the greatsword into the ship for the next turn. The, the problem I with this play... I second myself on that one. <laughs> The problem with this play, though, is that if he does do that, he's going to miss out on the buffs from the Vorker Hunter, which is one point each turn. It may not seem like much, but that certainly does go a long way. Jorah able to just barely stay ahead of Freddy. He, every single play Jorah makes has to enable him to stay ahead, and that 
it really well, does disrupt like, his what? play. This is an excellent death mold. Yep. Excellent death mold, eliminating the Lakshmi right there. Freddy is really uh, kind of, you know, exercising the control that Radovid decks tend to always have. Radovid's traditionally been a very strong control leader, and while we haven't really had a solid control meta in a while, I would say that Radovid has always done well in tournaments because of that. Being able to deny and disrupt strategy is, is uh, just so valuable in tournaments because, you know, strategy is such a high level. A lot of the game takes place on the deck building screen, and if you can just deny an opponent's strategy, it's just you're able to pressure them. You can able to you can get cards out of your opponent uh, by just getting ahead in this situation because these the, the plays become slower and slower for Jora. The, the the point gap gets really tight. We see him playing Croc here for Ginger Fred. He has, to, he has to make his big power play. Yes, he has to, and he misses out on setting up the great swords. It's really disrupting his his late game. Mm -hmm. But if he does maintain that card advantage over Freddy, he may not need to do that. He already has a very powerful potential sick griefer right there by pulling out Janga, which will be 17 base strength in round three. And he also has the likes of uh, Renew, which he can potentially go into Avalok to make round three a little bit longer and still set up that engine. So Jora is looking to be in a very solid position, especially considering that all the locks are out for Freddy. Radovid, Margarita, it's all gone. So. At this point, Freddy cannot really deny any more of uh, Jora's play, especially having Death Bolt gone down as well, unless he presses something like that for Margarita. Like, he only has one more option to deny him something, and from that point onwards, uh, it's Jora's time to have fun. Freddy's just gonna have to rely on tempo at that point, and his hand is not favoring that at this moment. Mm. Whereas Jora, looking at Renew perhaps for round three, not only is that, uh, you know, it's, it's very good to prolong the round, but also uh, accrue the resources that he needs to win, like Sigurd Reef, just to make this a little bit juicier for him. He already has three Priests of Freya and Restore. That represents a lot of potential in a long round. But Jora's got to get out of this round first before he's able to renew off a lot, because that's sticking on the board right now. This is a perfect time to play the Virgin Berserker, in my opinion, because he, he has uh, free points to do so. Mm -hmm. uh, Freddy was only able to tie the score. Uh, and Raging Berserker, the weakness with for the card is that it is a very low tempo play initially, but then it can actually can capitalize on it. But he's gonna opt to go for the Freya instead, perhaps trying to set up a, a great sword here, Modern which would make sense as well. Patient, well, I mean, he's got to no say, or going with the shape, going with the shape. Just, just trying to make sure. Okay, so, so Jora here is trying to really make sure that he stays ahead, and I like this line of play. Yeah, I mean, he's got to put Freddy on an amazing hand at this point. Even though Freddy's hand doesn't look that great for, for, from our point of view. I mean, it isn't bad. Obviously, Shani's very strong commander swing represents a lot of swing. But those Temerian infantrymen uh, at this point, uh, it's not something that Freddy wants to play, obviously, because the, you know, the potential is a little bit lower. And uh, it's really, it's, you know, it's a really strong finisher uh, in round three. So but Jora does definitely have to stay ahead. And since he has to stay in this, as long as Freddy wills it, you might as well try to get an engine going if you one possible. of us or not. Down goes Hero Scout, searching out for the last and final uh, Seize Tower, but there are no crewmen to capitalize on that. Again, going back to the in the very first play of this game, that Orphan Hunter onto the first Blue Stripe Scout, forcing John Natalis to reinforcement into the second Scout instead of Ronvid has. See, look at all, all the amount of, of points he's avoided by that. Oh, look, look at how many machines we're looking at. Five. The, all those five machines would have gotten an extra amount of value because of that crewman. So that alone has made such so much of a difference. Like the fact that he let off with that hunter at the beginning. It, it just it goes to show how like, every single play in this game matters so much. Yeah, it's, it's really close right now. And you made a really good point about the Young Berserker earlier. It's not a bad time to play it because you can afford it, right? Yeah. You, the six point play is not too slow in this situation. Plus it is growing next turn because of the ship's ping on it to turn it into the Raging Bear. So. Uh, you know, the consideration could be made for the Young Berserker, but it may be the Freya that Jora plays. I, think, I, I like, like Great Sword here. I like Great Sword here. Oh no, he's good. No okay, insult. okay. Okay, no, so he's just completely focusing on. He, he doesn't want to. He doesn't care about building up the rest. He believes that he can win by just having one card over his opponent. And I, I, like I said, I like this approach. By playing these ships earlier on, that's, they're going to amount to more value overall. So it's actually, it makes a whole lot of a difference. Like if you play a ship one turn later, that means two points less overall. And two points can mean the whole thing because Jorah does not see Freddy's hand like we do, <laughs> unfortunately for him. I mean, I'm not the most seasoned Greatsword player out there, but I think that the case could be made that the Greatsword into the ship could have been totally fine and pr created a, potentially a better target in round three for the rest. Yeah. But Jorah's got a different idea. It's a little bit slower though. It's a little bit slower than just playing the other uh, ship. Like, 
it's very clear that Jora is fearing something like this, like this Commander's Horn. Like, he wants to be prepared for these huge swings that are coming now. Like, uh, you know, Commander's Horn, Temerary Infantrymen, Dijkstra, etc. So he wants to make sure that he can catch up to that, and he's done an excellent job at doing so. Not concerned about any sort of Igni in this situation or Scorch, and, uh, well, we know we have the deck list, and there is no reason to be concerned, but it is risky here. I mean, uh, in Skellige, Normally, with Harpooners, you can expect to see Igni, but Great, Great Sword's a little bit different. He already knows about Avalok, and he can assume about Coral. Exactly. There are some mystery bronzes, though, but without Harpooners, you can make a safe call, I think, in this situation. Oh, definitely, especially considering that uh, it's pretty... I'm, I'm pretty sure Freddy recognizes this list, especially after, after seeing Avalok go down. It is extremely... It's actually identical to Shaggy's uh, variant, Freddy oh, Project Wind Slam. So he pretty, I'm pretty sure Freddy is very aware of the gold line of Jorah's mm -hmm. bringing here and is uh, it does not consider that a threat and you know he's right in that so you know props to Freddy for acknowledging Dex and uh, just performing really was well. this is the, like one of the best competitors out there he's, he's just always been so good at this game and has beaten among, like the top players in the world like uh, uh, Freddy man a lot of people are excited to see like a potential Freddy Babes uh, life coach matchup for example but Jora man if Jora pulls the upset here it would be perhaps the biggest upset in Gwent history I think the thing about Freddy Babes is that he didn't have to buff both of those siege towers in that situation yeah see he's got that extra card it worked out for him yeah no that's good that's pretty good right there so he is able to enjoy just kind of planning for the future at this point I mean, Shaggy made that deck look good in Gwen Slam. He made it look really good. That was that was one of the decks that he uh, was part of his two. He went up 2-0 against Tailbot in that matchup there, and uh, death. And he actually got the mill. It was a similar situation where he was playing against Northern Realms, and he did actually get Tailbot down to zero cards, or at least was holding on to basically a dead Deekstra. And uh, you know, I think there was a couple a couple of dead cards. So, uh, and Jorah is in a in a in a like the position here for Jorah. He does have the extra card, which is pretty big, but that extra card at the moment is Oodle Rick. I wonder if he decides to hold on to it. I, I think he was determining if he could actually afford to play Oodle there to center his deck a little bit better. Mm -hmm. But he uh, ultimately decided not to because he probably wasn't able to do so. So, yeah, uh, this this is going to come down to basically the mulligans. Yeah. As we're going to see go. uh, a battle main that's actually pretty good. And here we go. He has one card over Freddy, but Freddy has a very powerful looking hand. Uh, well, that, um,. That, uh... Mm, the Blue Dream's the just blue looking dream. at Avalok right now. Just Coral wasn't played, right? neither was Muzzle. Yeah, it's only... That Blue Dream is not that good, then, because I don't know if he wants that. I'm pretty sure he does not want that. That Blue Dream is terrible, actually. I mean, I'm an advocate for Blue Dream a lot of times, oh, but this is a situation that's not so good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that's... Wow, that's like one of the first times that Blue Dream in round three is like we not... Like, that's that's crazy. But also, Renew on cool. Avalok bricks the dream. Mm. On top mm -hmm. of that. Yeah, on top, on top of, of that. the fact like, that he can't Freddy afford it. Want to drive he can't afford it. He can't afford it. Like, he, there's no way he can afford it. And also, like, something I wanted to point out when you were saying, like, about this deck's performance, uh, Croc on Craig Greatswords, I believe its best matchup is this. It's Northern Realms. Like, because against other factions like Monster, if, if they have uh, cards like Caretaker or Necrorath, they can really disrupt your, your gameplay. Against Nilfgaard Spies, you just don't want to even see them because Mr. Blood Highly along, Curious Space, and Gamer Gamora Medic just really, really craps on your, your plans. And then uh, the other matchup into consideration with perhaps the Squeta or Skellige, and that's more, you know, debatable, but Northern Realms is easily the best one because of the ability they have to efficiently thin through their deck, and because they don't really have the best answers for powerful great big resurrections. Yeah. yeah, I just realized that I said that a Renew would brick the Dream, but the Dream can play Renew, am I not? Am I, is, that, is that wrong? The Blue Dream would be able to play Renew in that situation, although... Oh, yeah, 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 no, no, yeah. If he plays Renew before Blue Dream, that would be bad, because he would be able to reutilize um, his John Natalis. But the question is, does he want to fit even more if he's going to... Like, yeah. Freddy Babes is in a very tough spot now, because every, anything that he does, like, his best plays require him to go through his deck. <laughs> so that puts him in a bad... <laughs> it's just really awful for him, as we see Jorah going with the second great sword. And it's going to seem like uh, Avalok is going to be the play here. I feel like you could make a case that he could have renewed Avalok a little bit earlier because he hasn't seen Temerian Infantry and he knows there's only six cards left in deck. He could actually screw the Temerian Infantry a little bit uh, or screw, screw up Freddy's hand in that situation. So you could have made a case there. It's risky, though, because he could lack a target for Battle Maiden if he does that. Like, if, if he if he draws into, like, his last great sword, for example, like, it could really disrupt his play. So I, I, do, I do understand what you're saying, but... 
it, 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 it's it's hard to do that, especially when you have like a, a, a basically like a tutor in your hand, right? You want to thin through your deck. You don't want like again going back to Shaggy versus Tailbot. Shaggy okay. played Frightener before thinning through his deck a little bit more uh, by playing the Crows and drew the last Crow. So you, you want to try to avoid something. that basically. And we're gonna see Shani in Death Bolt on to the Great Sword, the one that is about to receive the buff. Very smart uh, choice there by Freddy in super focus mode right now as it's coming down to this man that infantry man is not nearly as powerful because the last blue stripe scout has not hit the table so it did not receive the last buff and jora has a lot of power still oh but he's gonna give him the renew oh it's tough i mean it's it's tough in this situation like but if he does i mean i'm pretty sure like it's very likely for him to draw like the last uh the last um, tactics card, right, for John Natalis. So if that happens, like, it doesn't even matter if he is able to pull off his John Natalis, because that's the only card, the only gold card that uh, Freddy Babies has played that is not in the graveyard, that is in the graveyard. Here we go. I mean, yeah, there's so much unknown here with this, uh, with this Avalok draw. Like, what are we going to draw for Freddy? Oh! Jager Dreef, a great draw. And oh! Coral Hug oh! draws oh! so good. Oh! Freddy's not oh! so much. Oh, what? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, the tactics and the... Oh, wow. my lord. <laughs> wow, that's so important. Oh, he's, he still has... No, he has no, he has no more tactics. That's it. Oh, he got him. That was the best Avalok I've seen in my life. We come back wow. to Blue Dream being bricked here because you don't want to you draw Jen Natalis. I mean, at least you can do that with the Renew, but that's not great. You got the Eternian <laughs> Infantryman. That's not great either. Marching orders will pull the... Uh, will pull the Blue Stripes I don't want to die. At this point. Oh it's man, he does the commando. Oh boy, oh wow. So and he, and he got like the best two draws. That's so good. <laughs> That's so funny. So much control for Freddy Babes, but may it be all for naught in this situation. Great sword, very strong in this matchup. Absolutely, absolutely devastating for Freddy. He's not only is he one card down, but Jorah just has a dream hand right now. I'm gonna place that Borg Park Hunter right next to the Great Sword. I'm gonna. Um, I'm not sure. He's just probably gonna hit one of the five uh, strength units to potentially deny value from a blue stripe scout. And I'm gonna be really interested to see what his restore target is right now. What is it? I mean, uh, how many hunters does he have? Does he have a hunter for a uh, battle? Well, he only had the one battle maiden. I mean, a, sh a ship is a good target anyways because it's stronger than a priest of the it's, it's like a three font to a ship because it's, it's adding three strength to its base strength, right? So that's good enough on itself, but I'm not sure if, does he have another battle maiden in his graveyard? I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if I recall that. Regardless, uh, this coral is looking to represent a total of at least 13 value onto that Rombit and also denying the crewman. While Sigrifa is aiming to just resurrect John Gafret, which will be a massive swing in his favor. Yeah, you said a dream hand for Jorah, and I absolutely agree. And we see dream in the hand of Freddy, but it's kind of a nightmare because yeah. you just can't get <laughs> Natalis to well work. Well played. <laughs> The clock is ticking. Freddy, the, sorry, Jorah really focused the year. I think we're going to see John Gafret. If he goes to Grufa, it's 100% going to be John Gafret. Uh, and he'll probably uh, hit the the greatsword and uh, either Shigrifa or you know the, the thing to the to the right of the Borger Hunter. But he could wait, wait. Okay, okay, okay. He went for a restore. Yeah. Yeah, and I think on the ship is fine. Like that was the lowest commitment yeah, play there. Shigrifa the and Coral are the big. No, those are the final finishing punches here in this situation here, and that's going to be the blue stripe scout. It will get a little bit of humans. Forget what I said. No, because it's not a five, because it gets buffed by the marching orders. It actually denies the group buffing that the Blue Stripe Scout would have been able to provide an additional four buffs uh, on those on those scenarios. Feels bad, man. <laughs> that feels, that I mean, feels horrible. That's going to be it right there. Yep. Freddy Babes. Jorah taking the first around. game. He's not going to show that last gold card. Again, very important in a tournament setting. Jorah going to go one up against the favorite opponent in this situation, Freddy Babes. What a great start there. It was a really good matchup for Jorah. And that, though that off lock at the end there was devastating for Freddy. Jorah capitalizing on the matchup really well. Very well done. Mm -hmm. Very well done there. So we have uh, just another recap of the bands there. Emir and Hensel are the bands. Jorah not being able to play Hensel and uh, Freddy not being able to play Emir in this situation. So far, so good for Jorah. Very nice start. I love seeing great swords in action. It's one of my favorite decks to watch. It's just so refreshing because this, uh, when Great Greatsword was released onto you mm -hmm. know the collection, it wasn't really considered viable. Yeah, absolutely. The players are just going to get ready for this next match here, but yeah, a really favorable matchup. I think we saw, I think we saw just a lot of the, a lot of the best ways that Greatsword can really abuse Northern Realms. There, forcing bad draws, extending around, and even though Freddy was able to control so many aspects of Jorah's deck, 
it just didn't matter. He was still able to pull it off. So it really speaks to the matchup in that situation. It really does. And it's also like a very, very clever lead for Jora. Twice we've seen, uh, we've actually casted this deck being the lead option, and twice it's been very dominant because of the, the ability to get that Northern Realms matchup. The question is, what will Jora go with now? Uh, he has uh, Emir, Emir Sama left, and he also has the Unseen Elder available. Two very powerful lists. Uh, I believe now Jora is going first, so we may very well see Unseen Elder. It says his deck is extremely focused on carryover with uh, a lot of a lot of good options, but you know, Emir Spies is also always great because Emir Spies rules. I'm going to put my money on Amir on Spies here, but maybe because it's the obvious choice, to me, that might not be what Jorah opts to go with. But Good point. you get the opportunity to play Nilfgaard in a tournament, you take it, especially when you're in Emir's house. He's going to finally make an appearance here in this tournament, one way or another. Jorah really debating what to go for here, and uh, it seems like the players are getting almost ready to jump into game number two. Freddy taking the first loss. Again, Freddy was extremely favored in this matchup. Mm -hmm. And it would be very shocking to see him go down. It's important to note, though, that um, even though this is not to set any excuses by any means or anything, but uh, Freddy has been feeling rather ill. There's kind of like a, a bit of a virus going on in this castle, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's infected all of us. <laughs> well, I mean, the only virus I'm infected by is excitement. Yeah, <laughs> no, but I know that Freddy, uh, I mean, Freddy's definitely got a lot of skill behind him. He just has to power through this one. I'm sure he's going to feel a bit better tomorrow, one way or another. But uh, he seems to know. perform really well, though. Like he's, he's focused. It's just that he got a very bad matchup for him. And uh, now we're gonna witness game two. And I think I saw Freddy click on Unseen Elder. Mm. I'm not mistaken. Oh, getting that, getting the snipe on that. Mm, yep. I think yeah. Let's let's get some money in Freddy's pocket. Maybe he'll start feeling better. But Jor is gonna see see to it that he can do as much as he can to prevent that. Five thousand dollars prize pool on the line here. So far, Jora has secured at least, in the worst case scenario, a grand. Freddy looking to get a little bit of his own piece of the pie here as we're just sorting out, uh, we're just making sure the coin is weighted properly so, you know, it, it lands on the right side. But we do see Freddy Babes opted to go with Unseen Elder, which definitely makes a lot of sense. Uh, especially like a, a very punishing list. It, it's it's kind of like a, a mixture of our carryover powers with uh, also um, swarm synergy too. I'm very intrigued to see. It, it, it kind of reminds me of like old school monsters in a way. And Jora, if he opts to go with um, the Nufgard, it'll be interesting because in the mirror, I'm not sure who will be favored here. You know, it's interesting if we if we look at the the monsters list here. Is we just kind of we're just gonna wait sure make sure that we get everything set up for the game here. Mm. The monster list from both players are are actually there is a lot of similarities to them, but neither of them they're both you know consume lists. Both run Unseen Elder, both running Neckers, but neither of them are relying on Necker Warriors. So we're not going to see sort of the greedy situation that some of the other Unseen Elders have been yes. put in, um, especially in Tailbot situation. Looks like we're going to get ready for this game to get started. Game number two of Freddy Babe versus Jora. Freddy Babe zero, Jora one. If Jorah needs two more wins to advance to the semifinals, Freddy Babes needs to start racking up those wins. Let's go, baby. Here we go. Shout out, of course, to the admins and to the production team. Long for live the Emperor! Here. We're going to get to see that Nilfgaard right here. Oh, boy. There we go. I'm excited. I got to get to cast the Nilfgaard game. Yes! <laughs> Oh, I thought I thought I wasn't gonna be able to. You like Nilfgaard? I didn't even know that. Oh, I hate it. Is that true? Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Amir, I'm joking. I forgot Amir's here. What a mistake. But I mean, you did call it the Unseen Elder coming out for Freddy here. So yeah, no Necker Warriors in this list. It is Neckers. It is a bit more of a reserved list from uh, from Freddy. Lots of carryover in Ekamara, Seleno Harpy with the eggs, Neckers of course, Slizzards for consistency, and you know some nice touches like Jermaine of Fox Hollow for Commander's Horn, Cleaver for the lock to synergize a little bit better with the Toad Prince. Actually, I take that back. Toad Prince actually not in Freddy's list. Nope, Toad Prince is not in Freddy's list, which is it's definitely something new. I think instead of that, he is running uh, Germain. Yeah. And he also is running Yennefer to combine. He's, he's, it's kind of like a hybrid. It's both like trying to abuse the uh, trying to abuse the carryover prowess of this build with the storm capabilities of his as well. Kind of like how we saw uh, Shaggy take a completely different approach earlier with his Unseen Elder. Mm -hmm. It seems like Freddy Babes has also gone there in a way, but like halfway. <laughs> if that makes any sense. A pair of great lead for Jorah. Uh, rather vulnerable to Cameron, but unfortunately for him, 
Uh, Freddy Babes is not running uh, that gold unit in his deck as Freddy really focusing here. I think you could make a case for a Selena Harpy lead. No, obviously not. Woodland Spirit. Woodland Spirit. Woodland Spirit. I didn't see that card. <laughs> yeah, I mean, Woodland Spirit applies the weather on the row, which of course applies that pressure, gets the Foglet out of the deck, one Foglet in Freddy's deck, and also gives him the Unseen Elder option um, for the follow-up round where he can consume the Wolves, get all the Harpies out of the deck just for a nice piece of tempo. Uh, again, Freddy kind of trying to apply that control, make this a little bit more difficult for Jorah. Jorah's Nilfgaard list, pretty standard. I guess the only thing to note for people who don't know, uh, he is running three Infiltrators, one Nausicaa Brigade, and two Vikovara Medics. Everything else is as you would expect, three ofs for the Enforcers, the Nausicaa, sorry, the Imperial Enforcers, uh, the Imperial Brigade, and the Emissary. Your humble sir. I'm gonna start off with the Emissary chain right the there, getting another I Emissary, no and pulling the Impera in for Very right. solid lead for him. Gonna opt to bop the Beast, deny the Unseen Elder play into uh, them, because as the, as they are a Beast, wait, what, why would you not target here? <laughs> oh, be, be, because he's concerned about being forced to go down minus two. As uh, Freddy Base is going down second, and the fog will take again, and we'll put him down to 12. So Freddy could potentially pass here yeah. and force an extra card out of Jora. Though I don't think that's the best plan, as Freddy Babes does have a strategy does, that relies heavily on carryover and will be very weakened. So I like that Jora committed to that because. The rabid wolves are beasts, so every, uh, the, the unseen elder can consume them and thus uh, spawn the harpy out of the deck and thin his deck and also prevent him with a huge tempo swing. So Jorah preventing that very nicely and uh, looking to have. Uh, I'm very intrigued about this list because it's, it's like one of the few ones that only runs that runs Azir instead of like the guardian and other options. And I like seeing Azir in action. So he's a very good card in my opinion. Yeah, I'm a big fan of a seer kind of tucking that tucking Roach back into the deck as Roach is also being run by Jorah, being able to source that a little bit later, perhaps through Village of Forts or K here, uh, K here, sorry. And uh, you know, we're going to see some classic stuff uh, as you know Jorah gets a little bit more through the deck here. Um, he'll be able to play. Uh, he'll be able to source a, shame a little bit I more from the emissary. We're talking about how emissary is one of the strongest cards in the game, just because it really if makes it hard strength, for you to not see everything stealth. you need to see from your Nilfgaard deck. Mm, Jorah is missing out a little bit on Enforcer value, but he can make up for this by... He, he just needs the gap to be able to do this, right? But he, he really needs to try to set up a, the second Enforcer because of that one, that first one is locked and try to bop one of the Emissaries so he can actually play Vic of our Medic and start getting another chain going on potentially. He really needs to get a little bit of momentum going on for him here as the Fog is really pressuring him and he still hasn't managed to catch up to Freddy Baze because even though he is at 25 points, he will be at 23. And Freddy Bay is making use of this tempo advantage and dropping the Salino Harp because start setting up some food some soon. A little early for a favorable pass here, even though Freddy Babes had two opportunities there to pass, uh, being up in points and up in cards, just a little bit early. And of course, wanting to develop that carryover is very important for the Unseed Elder deck. Jorah is now, he's a little bit out of reach to just drop an Enforcer at this point. Uh, but like you said, being able to source an Emissary right now with a Vikovara Medic would be a great idea. But he may be resorting, he may have to resort to play something either very low tempo and risk, uh, and take a risk, but I mean, the Emperor Brigade is fantastic here. Mm -hmm. Dropping down at 12 points, which is more than enough to get a little bit, close the gap a little bit here and maybe afford him to finally get that Enforcer out. No Sailak also in Jorah's hand, which makes this a little bit tougher for him. Yeah, ooh. Ooh, mm. yeah. <laughs> Interesting pass. I, I, I guess I guess Jorah is trying to aim for a relatively long round, in, in which he can still disrupt uh, the carryover game of Freddy. But interesting pass there by Jorah. I, 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 I believe he's trying to improve his hand a little bit and trying to get a proper, uh, you know, spy, you know, a proper spy round for him. But the problem is he's already played these triple uh, emissaries, and now he's limited to. Uh, resurrecting them, but what this means is that he can no longer chain emissaries, and that's one of the most powerful things about Spy Nilfgaard, being able to chain multiple emissaries and proc uh, and pair enforcers again and again and just completely disrupt what your opponent is trying to do. And uh, Jorah is kind of missing out on that and is in a little bit of an awkward spot with that pass, mm -hmm. as Freddy has a tremendous carryover game here, it can just bleed him. He yeah. can just push as hard as he can. He has double Ikimara, Necker, potentially uh, Dorgarain to a third Ikimara. It's just Ekimara, Ekimara Simulator here. 
Now, Jorah drew a very important card in this matchup as well in Peter Star Gwenlev, which is a huge denial of yes. Necker value, not just removing the boost, but deleting it from the game. You can't even slizzard it. It basically doesn't exist. Uh, Freddy is not running anything like a shadow or anything to uh, source additional Neckers outside of the slizzard, but the slizzard can't get something that doesn't exist in the graveyard. Peter is one of the strongest cards in this matchup. And uh, you know, having Amir being able to pick him up mm. if he needs to, Highly just in case he needs case. to deny an Ekamara on top of that, uh, at least make the Ekamara much worse uh, for a tempo play on top of it. So, a lot of opportunities for Jora to disrupt Freddy's strategy. This is the best scenario Jora could hope for. Uh, he has this is like his and one chance to get a, a solid, uh, yeah, at least a, a, an emissary chain. Basically, he denies the, the two eggs to prevent, you know. Uh, either Ran Warrior or Ekimara potentially to capitalize on them as he does get the Enforcer with three procs due to the uh, Vicavar Medic Chain. He could potentially bounce it back, but I think in this matchup you 100% want to bounce uh, Peter. You have to bounce Peter, especially uh, when we're looking at a, a deck that not only is running Necker, but Ekimara. Uh, even though Peter is not as efficient against Ekimara, because he just basically halves his power, it's still better than nothing, and uh, here we see uh, the Unseen Elder gonna chomp down on all those beasts, and gonna thin the deck, and gonna provide him with a ridiculous swing that actually puts uh, Jor in a very bad spot. Yeah, that Unseen Elder play is so strong. I mean, the changes to Harpies really made this leader take off a little bit. And, you know, we've seen players build in a little bit more insurance into their Monsters decks. Woodland Spirit does create three beasts on the board. The Harpy Eggs in Carryover does create the young Harpy Hatchlings, which all count. And then Jermaine on top of that, Decent. providing the cows that for eating. So it just makes it a little bit less likely that you won't be able to get your Harpies out. As it is a strategy that you can at least counter. We've seen Ballistas make short work of, of that on the Wolves or the cows from Jermaine in some previous matchups. But for Freddy does get it there, and it was a huge play as well, uh, putting about 20 points ahead of his opponent there. Yeah, that puts Jora in a very vulnerable position, but it's still a little bit too early for Freddy to pass, in my opinion, especially with double Ekimara in hand and the Necker, too, even though the Necker's probably is obviously going to get answered. But he has not, sorry, not double Ekimara, potentially three Ekimaras, again, with that Doric Array, which can spawn an Ekimara as well. Uh, Jora has to start making some very strong plays to be able to deny this. Also, Freddy's Royal Decree is looking to aim for Yennefer, which could be absolutely devastating here. It could actually potentially lead Freddy Babes to a 2-0 if Jora does not react fast enough to it. I mean, the, like, Freddy's in a great position here. He's able to establish a lot of carryover through the Neckers, uh, through uh, the Akamara, of course. The Slizzard is able to source, I believe, one more Seleno Harpy. I apologize if I maybe missed one, but I think that is available to him. On top of that, Door Gray with the Akamara. The Neckerat does have some pretty big targets. At least no we know Cleaver is in the graveyard, so that's at least a nine point play. Uh, a nine, sorry, a 14 point play for the Nekirat. And then on top of all of that, when it's all said and done, that swarm is boosted by Yennefer. And should Jora even be able to get past that, then he has to get past all the carryover on top of that through the Neckers and the Akamara. The reason why Jora was really debating about uh, picking up that Rain Farm or not, you know, Mr. I Cry every time right there, is because Rain Farm is dead right now. All emissaries are out of the deck. The can throws out of the deck. Joaquin is in his hand. So uh, there is no spy left in Jora's deck for Rain Farm to tutor. As there is the Yennefer. There, that is the perfect turn for Yennefer. It's going to be tremendous. As I said numerous times, boom, bar right there. <laughs> Look at that. A trademark Mogwai. <laughs> 62 right points. 62 point lead for Freddy. What do you do? It's absolutely sure. devastating. And I was talking about Yennefer maybe being a later play, but honestly, when you have this many units on the board, Joris has got two at this point. You take Yennefer for not going to get a better chance here, I think. And on top of all of it, it's a great matchup for Nilfgaard. We saw Freddy Babes let Nilfgaard through. Sure, you're going to give me units on my board. I'm going to take advantage of that with Yennefer. Yeah, Yennefer is extra punishing here because of the spy gameplay. Like, brilliant deck by Freddy. I really like this list because it's still very threatening with the Neckers, but it combines that with the Swarm capabilities. I, I think this, this deck just seems very yes. strong to me. And I mean, we, I talked about how Nilfgaard might have been the obvious choice on the blue coin. Freddy smelled that, I think, and just queued Alder right into it, specifically for this reason. I like it. Good job, Freddy. <laughs> well done, Freddy. Uh, interesting. That was a seer. That yeah, that was a seer. Uh, did, he, he returned an emissary, right? I yeah. believe yeah. so. He returned an emissary to, to his. That would be to his opponent's deck, right there. As he returned that, and I believe an imperial enforcer. 
Is that what happened? Well, Roach isn't out there because all golds haven't, none, no golds have been played from Jora at, at any point here, although we're going to get to see Roach here as Kahi is going to come down. Potentially to pick. Ah, uh, hmm. How would Wait. you use Kahi here? There, here. He, he, returned, he returned an emissary to his opponent. Th does he want to disrupt Freddy's draws or. If he plays Joaquim, then he no longer has a target for Rain Farm. And he gets a very nice pull there with Joaquim. But Joaquim is generally a unit that you want to preserve for round three because it is one of the most powerful swings Nilfgaard has in the no short time. round. And uh, he's letting that go. I, I yeah. think here you pull the Imperial Brigade. It gets a tremendous buff. It's definitely the, the unit to go for here. And it Come does on, enable uh, Jorah to try to catch up a little bit. But even with that ridiculous swing in his favor, He's still so far behind. Yeah, that's the whole thing, right? You're talking about making these big plays for round three, but Jorah's got a hell of a mountain to climb here, and Freddy's showing, showing no uh, no relent right now as he's already played one Nakamara, and he's probably going to try to establish that second one as well. Lots of focus on Freddy Babe's face here. Rainfarn not looking so good anymore. Uh, Peter is probably going to be okay, especially because Emir can bounce him back up again. Yeah, but it's not, it's not, it's not like even Peter is... Oh, it's just... Like, that Rainforn is absolutely dead, so he has to mulligan that away later down the line. Kahir, I, I guess, you know, Kahir has Peter as a target, right? So he can Namir and Kahir Peter, so he's able to reset three units, so he's going to be able to deal with the carryover game. But the question is, how does Jorah make up 40 points? <laughs> exactly. I mean, Menno is a pretty big swing right here, but that's still, like, just a small piece of the deficit that Jorah is looking at at this point. And I think we are going to see Menno. I mean, what bigger target are you going to get? with this, even though you could, like, you mm -hmm. could argue for how many Infiltrators the has Empire. he played. He is running triple Infiltrator. Yeah. So may maybe a little bit premature because he has a uh, Force in hand because he could have pulled an Infiltrator and targeted the uh, Ekimara, which is the same strength as Cantarella. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't have the best target for Village of Forts, though. He only had, like, I mean, he probably wants Roach for Village of Forts in this situation. Yeah. I mean, I think, I don't think Roach without, with, without Mano on the board, that was just would have been the Enforcer, would have been the lowest target. And then you're looking at double-digit destruction from Village of Forts. So probably not the best idea. It's here comes. Above all to be just. He's gonna dip Peter and take him right back into hand. And really close the gap right there. Well done by Jorah. Like now, because Freddy has pushed so much to get advantage of his carryover, Jorah is actually gonna be able to enter round three, potentially with the same amount of cards. And that's really good. But the question is, does Jorah have enough power? He's used Joaquim. He, his rainfall is, is dead. He's already used Menno. Like, what does he have left? I mean, I believe Peter on an Ekamara is enough. Correct me if I'm wrong. Oh yeah, P P Peter on Ekamara is more than enough. It's just eight points, but he's gonna go with Kahir instead because he wants to preserve Peter. Mm -hmm. It's yeah, it's yeah. really important. It's, it's the it's the best play. Peter into uh, Kahir into Peter is the best. He's gonna be able to reduce uh, that Ekamara to three base Become strength, folk. limiting Furry Babe's carry over to uh, nine strength instead of twelve. And yeah, that that play is more than enough right there. The, again, the question here is. Does he have enough options? Because he's already played Azir, so he can't like return Roach for a little bit of extra value. He has to only going away Rainfarn. He, he's brought back an Enforcer, if I remember correctly. I, I'm just hoping that he doesn't think that he returned the Emissary to his deck. Oh, I, I mean, I don't... Well, I mean, I sure, I sure hope that's not the case. I'm actually more worried about Rainfarn coming out from Village of Forts if, if Rainfarn gets mulliganed away. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's the worst case scenario yeah. for Jorah at this point. It definitely is. I, I'm just curious to see, because we know he has an Enforcer. We know he still has an Infiltrator. Mm -hmm. um, what, what else does he have in his deck? Does he still have, like, he has a Nausicaa Brigade still. Yes. Right? So those are, those are three. Three cards. Uh, I'm missing two right now. Yeah, a single Nausicaa Brigade, and uh, I believe there might be a Vikovara Medic that's still in the deck. No, he's already well, played two. He's, he's already played both. There's, There's a Nausicaa Brigade. Brigade. Wait, is he? Yeah, it's got to get rid of Rain Farm. Yeah, you have to get rid of Rain Farm. Okay, okay, so he's aware. He's aware. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, it was the third Imperial Brigade. I wasn't sure, but it was the third Imperial Brigade. Looking bad. Looking bad. That is what you fuck lack. Oh, boy. He'll be able to stop one, but he won't be able to stop them. This is well, I mean, stopping, really rough. Stopping one isn't the worst thing in the world here, but uh, that extra card that Freddy has is, uh, this is, all is the Necker, which is going to be pretty big. He's going to be able to at least take a Seer. The common this do, this is Dunzo. Like, he has a Nausicaa Brigade. He has no spies left in his deck. It's a five-point bronze. And Vilgefort, <laughs> what is Vilgefort going to pull? Like, per perhaps, well, he could pull an Infiltrator. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. He could pull an Infiltrator and get some value to Nausicaa Brigade. Okay, okay. So it's still not over. Because if he pulls, if he pulls uh, Infiltrator here, it's still, it's still, it's I mean, it's we're, look, we're looking at a silver still, lining here yeah. on a very great cloud yeah. here for Jora. Especially because he has to burn something like Peter, like that. That, that basically makes uh, Vilgefort like a three strength 
uh, quote unquote uh, tutor. You know, even though he's a very, very chaotic tutor. And what I mean by tutor for newer players or people who are getting new into card games is cards that search for other cards in the deck, uh -huh. basically. And Vilgafort pulls the top card out of your deck at the expense of basically burning one of your units alive. Mm -hmm. He's a very nice guy. So he's just a three strength play, really, if you're burning up Peter. Stars reflected in the spawn for the. Oh, no. I, 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 I I'll never get that quote right. Oh, there it is. Rain there fire. it is. R Omega rip. <laughs> yeah, that's not what you want to see at all. Unfortunately for Jorah, it's looking like this is a little bit out of reach here. Not able to really develop anything that's going to be good enough for the Nazca Brigade. Freddy's got that extra card. Dorgaray is uh, is just you know fairly low commitment here. He's going to hold on to that last uh, the last Necker, I believe, and it's going to be all she wrote here. Well, she have probably gone for the uh, for the Wyvern uh, style points. Sorry, <laughs> the style points. Yeah. Well. Yeah, that's going to be it. I don't think Jorah has any neat reason to even show the card. It's Freddy a... with a great matchup just smashed that matchup. That's exactly why he let Nilfgaard through, because he had the solution. He put Jorah on picking it on the blue coin and uh, executed it beautifully. I think uh, I think Jorah's pass was a little bit premature, perhaps, and he definitely got punished for it. That Yennefer was so devastating. Yeah, it was round. definitely the reason why uh, Freddy was so dominant there. Mm. We're one to one here. We're in the back half of the quarterfinals here at Gw uh, Gwent Challenger number two, a milestone event here at Majna Castle in Poland. If you're just tuning in for some of these later matches, I know a lot of you out there love Freddy Babes, and of course we have Game King and Life Coach coming up shortly after this matchup here. We're tied <laughs> one to one. I'm excited to watch that one, Miguel, but I'm also excited to see how this one pans out because yeah. Jora is definitely, you know, he is the dark horse, right? We're not quite sure. We haven't seen a lot of Jorah here. We haven't seen a lot of Jorah here, uh, you know, in the tournament scene. Uh, many uh, tournaments have passed since Gwent Open, but he's already taken a game away from Freddy Babies. Both players got a little money in their pocket at this point. Getting a win against a player like Freddy is definitely not something to overlook. Like, that is a very big accomplishment. Jorah uh, is definitely performing, but he did get a little bit outplayed here in this second match against uh, the Unseen Elder right there. I hope that he can get a win with Nilfgaard Spies, but that is perhaps my little, a little bit of personal bias talking. <laughs> Which is a great trait to have as a caster, don't you agree? Oh, I mean, oh, bias. Look at that rate, though. How can, I, how can I resist? Come on now. Oh, uh, I mean, it's like, hey, man. <laughs> Put that back. I, I, had tough, the glory. Right? I, I had the the glorious moment of taking a picture with the Emperor himself. I asked him if I could be one of his commanders. Uh, he told me he would think about it, so I, I, I don't know. I, I hope uh, I hope he, he does. A shout out to a lot of the cast of characters that we're seeing in Gwent Challenger right now. Some excellent, I mean, they're not really costumes, right? They're the real characters. So they're just dressing the way they dress, right? <laughs> But it's really some fantastic stuff that's going on here at the castle. A really a deeply themed uh, Gwent event. Something for all Witcher fans to enjoy. And for Gwent fans, top tier play here as we're one to one here in the third quarterfinals matchup here. Freddy Babes taking on Jora. We're going to see what Freddy Babes is going to lead off with now as he is now having to go first. Uh, Jora with the Henselt ban. Already, as soon as the players ready. are getting ready, and we're going to jump into game three very soon. What will the players bring this time around? Jora will go second again, so we can either expect uh, Nilfgaard Spies to come back or him to try to abuse the carryover game of his own Unseen Elder, as Freddy Babes does have Radovid and his Croc on Crate list, which is actually, I'm not gonna try to spoil too much, guys, but it is different than the other ones we see today. We'll have to wait to see that list, of mm -hmm. course, because it looks like we're going to go back into Nilfgaard. Jorah is going to take uh, take the red coin on this one and uh, try to push through with, like we said before, a very, very strong deck in today's uh, meta, pro ladder, regular ladder, tournaments, whatever you want to call it. Nilfgaard has such a heavy presence, attracts a lot of bands, and, you know, a lot of salt if you've played against Nilfgaard. Sometimes they are just so hard to beat because they are so efficient and have so much control potential. Also, a deck that requires quite uh, it has quite a high skill gap, basically. It's not an easy deck to pilot by any means. It really rewards uh, high-level play. 
and it's not really as um, oppressive in the lower ranks, but it's definitely very very strong in the higher up on, on uh, you know higher end point on the ladder. As we are gonna see Radovid facing off against Nofrak. Radovid is perhaps the best. Uh, Northern Realms option and one of the best leaders against Nilfgaard spies in general because of his ability to lock two units so he has the ability to shut down two spy engines and spy engines are how spy Nilfgaard wins round one most of the time so being able to negate that is very key also triple blue stripe scout, uh, scout in his hand which is very a very nice thing to have because we did see in that first game how Jora negated the blue stripe scout and forced Natalis and reinforcements out of him that's definitely not going to happen now. As I like how Jorah, by the way, mulliganed away the Impera Enforcers. That's a very... That's a good... That's a, the trait of a good no card player. Die. Because you want to pull the Impera Enforcer out of your deck with the Emissaries. So you get the multiple procs happening before uh, the Enforcer itself can be dealt with. Now, would you say, Miguel, that the threat of Radovid alone will maybe uh, hold Jorah back to play two enforcers? Like, not yeah, only because Rad Radovid can obviously shut down the two enforcers, but just because Radovid exists in this game, it's going to really change the way Jorah is going to try to develop an engine to really push this round. That's why Radovid, I think, is such a solid uh, tournament option, and Freddy Baby is definitely behind. a very big fan of this leader. He's brought him multiple times, uh, perhaps one of his favorite options. Uh, as, a, as a tournament uh, deck and as, as a leader option for competitive play, Radovid puts a lot of pressure on a lot of the very different decks. It has the ability to deny very proactive strategies. Spy Northguard, you can shut down the engine. Against Unseen Elder, you can shut down the Neckers and deny the carryover. And the list goes on and on. Red of it is very efficient and it's very key here. And it may force Jora, as you said, to play a little bit suboptimally. Yeah, it's you know it doesn't have doesn't have as much specialization as full test. Maybe not the abuse of Hensel, but it makes every matchup just a little bit more favorable because of that shutdown potential of Radovid. So I definitely see where Freddy Babes is coming from. I personally like Radovid as a leader as well. He's just generally very strong. 14 points, double lock, and just again his existence changes the way your opponent will play because when you give your opponent two great units to lock, they're gonna get locked. And here comes out the second emissary. We're going to see if Jorah is going to shy away from that. I, if, if, if he's led to a point in which he has to do a shame, the Enforcer no or, or uh, Impair Brigade, oh, I would go for Brigade. I'm falling mm. behind. Oh, he's oh, going to play into it. He's going he's gonna to play right. I mean, <laughs> but he, he has, he's going to get a ridiculous chain here, though. Like, you got to give that to him. Like, he's going to get a lot of value out of these Enforcers before Radovic can jump him down, right? He opts to not hit any of the Spies, though. Like, not directing the last hit to an Emissary, which it is, is a, a play a lot of uh, Nilfgaard spy players go for, because that enables your Vicovar Medic to continue the chain, right? But Radovic goes down, he's like, I had enough of this, stop shooting at me! Yeah. <laughs> Calm down. <laughs> really, I mean, ask and answer, right? You're asking for Radovid and you're gonna get him. It's basically an open invitation for Radovid to come down because now this makes it very difficult for Jorah. Now we've seen Jorah make a lot of early passes in some situations where the point total either required a lot of commitment or the opportunity to go behind. Jorah hasn't been afraid to go behind either, but you know we've seen some very early passes. So if Freddy is able to shut this down, you know if, if Jorah is not able to really mount an attack here, he may go ahead and take the card as he is on the uh, the red side of the coin this time. And he's hovering over oh, he's thinking about again. He, he, he's, he's making a lot of like, very early passes. He's only 12 points behind, though. I, I, I'm not sure. I mean, he played right into the red of that, but I guess he just wanted to get that out of him. I don't know. He's, he's, he's was really debating. I, I don't know if I... He, he's... It's always better to, mm. to win around a card down than to lose around the card up, right? It's, it's, yeah, it's not always, it depends on if you have a spy available to you or not, but he does have a spy. He has Cantrella, so he can, can get that card advantage back. And uh, he can really pressure him in a, in a relatively wrong round as well, but he's opting to, ooh, that mulligan into Roach as well. Oh man, that's rough. I don't know if I agree with that pass. I'm not sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you, Miguel, why would you even bother playing the Enforcer Ray if Groot. you were planning on passing if Radovid were to hit you? Did you think that Red Freddy was not going to play Radovid into two Enforcers? Uh, I, I don't know. Maybe he just wanted to get that out of him, but it's, it's honestly mm -hmm. like hard for me to say. The, the Vico is, he wants to, well, no, he's going for the Emissary. I thought maybe he was, well, what am I talking about? I forgot what I just said. <laughs> He, he played the Vicovaro Medic and uh, dropped the Emissary between the two crewmen. Very important there because uh, when you play a machine between two crewmen, it gets the full maximum value out of its deploy effect or, you know, in, in, in all cases, it's the deploy effect. Yeah, it gets the most value out of that, right? So by placing that Emissary between those two, 
That emissary is the unit between the two crewmen, so it denies the maximum value of Freddy's machine. So very nice placement there by Jora, pulling the Imperial Brigade out. And it'll be interesting to see uh, exactly you know, what Jora's approach is here, because Freddy's about to put some serious tempo here on him. Yeah, Freddy's strategy is executing just fine now. He's able to get his deck thin. He's going to probably put another emissary between the uh, that crewman pocket. Uh, at this at this point, it is a possibility. Uh, Emir also being able to, I yeah, play uh, play Sealock and pick it back up again, which is also able to source another Patience emissary. Is not Still a for the blocking, but again, perhaps uh, able to source another enforcer and at least. And there goes Your another excellent sir. placement with the emissary pulling the last Impera enforcer out of his deck. Now, now is when uh, Jora is going to be able to catch up because his enforcer is going to proc twice and is going to be able to. For him to catch up by just one point. Actually, no, never mind. I forgot about Amir. He's still behind. This could be a good pass for Freddy. But the question is, is Freddy confident in a long enough round against the Nilfgaard Spies? Even though he's already gotten like most of the engine components out, especially the Enforcers, which are the most disruptive because they can prevent cards like Commander's Horn from getting full value, uh, amongst mm -hmm. other things, right? So it's going to be interesting to see exactly when uh, Freddy opts to pass because he still has a lot of valuable uh, tempo plays available to him, right? But... What kind of late game is Freddy envisioning right here? Jora still has, you know, really solid options to follow up, you know, with K-Lag into the Emissary. Uh, Vic of Aromatic resurrecting another Emissary and continuing to chain a little bit more. So the, the longer this round goes, the more of a snowball -y effect Jora will have. While Freddy is still opting to go, and I, he's going to set up that uh, kill onto the... Uh, Imperial Enforcer. Mm -hmm. Because he was targeting the Vicar Varmanek first, there was no need for him to place that battering ram uh, right next to the Blue Stripe Scout, which does play a little bit around uh, Lassery on top of that. So very solid I position by Freddy. Very, very solid position by both players, honestly. But that's why they're amongst the best, right? As there goes a highly curious K, he's going to pull the Infiltrator. Going to probably tag that battering ram to get the maximum potential value out strength. of the Nazca Brigade. Stuff. Unless he wants to deny, deny the crewman, right? But I, I don't think that's mm. worth it. Yeah, Freddy's got a lot I'm of bet, answers yeah. to the engine here uh, at this point, as Radov tends to do. Uh, the potential to divide, to basically take out all three enforcers and still win around against your Nilfgaardian opponent is pretty good. Mm. Jora is now also stuck with a roach in hand, so the, the further that Freddy pushes, the worse Jora's hand starts to look. He is able to play uh, Sealak twice with Kahir on top of that, so that's going to help him just get through his deck a little bit better and make sure for a very consistent final round as he does still have Rainfarn in the deck. He would have to get rid here. This is tough, right? How does Rainfarn look when you have Joachim and Cantarella in hand and you have to mulligan Roach away? It's the story of uh, Jorah's experience with Nilfgaard Spies in this tournament. Like, yeah. He's put in a very bad spot in which, as you said, he can't like... He, he may be forced to play Roach out of hand and try to get it back with his ear, but will he have an opportunity to do so when this is such a tight race uh, right now for Tempo? Like, Freddy will not continue to play unless he's sure that he, or, or he believes uh, that he can actually get that extra card mm -hmm. out of Jora, which is his main objective. Well, Jora's objective is to catch up, but like I said, even though he's lost the, he's lost the Enforcer, he still has two engines, and Freddy is not running Scorch, so he has no way to stop this as of right now. I want to note the uh, Hen Marvin's Blue Dream for Freddy. Once again, is not looking great here. Now, he didn't show it in the last run, so Jorah doesn't know that he has it for sure. But the Nilfgaard Golds are not great for Hen Marvin's Blue Dream. Kahir is basically useless. Meno needs a disloyal target, which is not able to source. And uh, Viljafort... Viljafort can be pretty good. Viljafort is pretty good, but I mean, of all the options that Jorah has to push this round, Viljafort may... Uh, may may be saved until later, but it also depends on how, Freddy, how hard Freddy wants to push here. I mean, Vigor Force does have a nice, uh, you know, scenario here with the Vigor Force medic, uh, but it's going to be interesting to see when he opts to play here, what target he's going to go for. It seems he's going to go for it now onto Kalak. Very standard approach, but honestly, I really like this. Uh, it thins his deck even more. He has double uh, Nilfgaard uh, Spy Engine in, on the board. And uh, Kahir, my son. <laughs> a shame I have here no feel like There's the, the Brigade, blowing. but he may go for the Infiltrator, but I would pick the Brigade here to knock out the... Uh, the Blue Stripe Scout, potentially. Though he's, uh, I think he's preserving it for um, no uh, door Joaquin is instead. Wait, 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 what? 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 Oh. what? Was that a misclick from Jorah? Did he mean to click the Siege Tech? He took the Spy Tech oh, off of definitely. the Blue Stripe Scout that, you know, he, when he, he had the opportunity to apply I it told to the you Siege so, Tech. I, I think he thought he pulled the Nausicaa for game. That may have just been a slip up from Jorah. He's not showing it on his face. No, but he's I he's trying to keep that poker face, but 
How, uh, Freddie Babe side, though, how do you look at that and not be like, hmm, that's a little strange. <laughs> Next level, please. Next level plays. I mean, something maybe I don't understand. <laughs> You're the Nilfgaard expert. Why would somebody remove this spy deck? Because reasons. Because reasons. Your majesty. Here we go. I cast myself <laughs> upon thy mercy. Got like into Emissary. Oh, man, that really, that really humble sucks for him, to be honest. But it, oh, that, that impaired. That's what he was searching for. That's Eddie getting Glass. massive. Eddie Glar, 16 yeah. points. There's no way Freddy is getting that card back, and that is very big news for uh, Jorah. Even though Jorah's hand is looking rather awkward, does he still have um? He he, he did not play an, uh, an infiltrator round one because he only played double enforcer, so he still has one more infiltrator left to potentially combine with Menno, and he's generated enough of a gap in which he can actually afford Cantrell at this point, mm -hmm. unless Freddy may uh, plays uh, Commander Horn now. Yeah, Freddy can push with Commander's Horn right here. We'll force Jorah to play something else. On top of that, the, the Siege Tower does at least get one crewman, so that is the 12-point play on top of that. Uh, so these are, you know, Freddy still has a lot of pressure that he can apply here. Blue Dream has nothing to work with at this point. No gold carts in Jorah's graveyard. Okay, so this is a 12-point play, which would put Freddy Babes at 78. Which would enable, yeah, yeah. There's the pass. There's the pass. I mean, if you're if you're Jora now, do you play Cantarella? Because mm. you can afford it. I mean, it's it's tricky, right? It's like you also have the option. I mean, it's so tough. Like his rainfire is not going to look good either way because he's got to get rid of Roach. So, I mean, it's 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 been just as sad as Rainfarn's premium art. You know, it, it's not it, a very it, happy person. <laughs> no, and uh, definitely not happy under the you know command of Jora here, as he's not been able to get value out of that uh, very powerful gold resource for me, because Bill of his draws. Honor. As we're gonna see him drawn to the infiltrator, has to probably replace Roach. I mean, this is awkward though. This is definitely awkward mm. because he he does have control. He has one card over uh, Freddy. But it's kind of like him giving 11 points to his opponent. So he needs to have some spice energy to make up for this. Even though Meno, like realistically, people may think, oh, Cantrell into Meno, that's so strong. But in reality, in round three, you just need to get more points than your opponent. So if you play Cantrell, you're giving your opponent 11 points. Uh, you're sacrificing that to have like an extra turn over him. Like, mm. it's, But it's not like you're giving him points, basically. So that makes Meno an eight point gold. It, 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 Points-wise, it's no more than that. What it does do on top of that, though, it does it gives you a little bit more extra room to play your cards because you will have like one extra turn over your opponent. But it's like points-wise, this is not good. Like this is not a good thing. Uh, even though, even if he has see. yeah, and there's Black rain card, that. and that's well, he's gonna put yeah. that at the bottom. Yeah, of his yeah, deck. Exactly. Exactly. Oh, oh no! no. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> no! Oh, Roach. Uh, I mean. There really wasn't any way he could play anything oh. before that. <sighs> oh man, see that's the thing, like, I, I, I don't know if it's his mulligans or if he's that unlucky, but he just has not been able to catch a break, man, with, with those, like, with Rainfarn. Like, Rainfarn has been the downfall of Jora a couple of times already, but I mean, I say downfall, but it's, it's nowhere near over here as Roach is going to go down. <laughs> you might as well do it, it gives a good Vilgefort's target, but Vilgefort's can get target, pulls Rainfarn again, and it's the same game, just like last game. See, see this is what I was talking about earlier, though. He should have gone for the Nausicaa Brigade instead of the Infiltrator, because now he would have had a solid uh, Azir target to return the buffed up, because the thing about Nausicaa Brigade is that it strengthens itself up to nine. It does not buff, so that means that when it goes to the graveyard, it is oh, nine strength. So if you return it to your deck with Azir and pull it out with Joaquin, you have a ridiculous <laughs> swing because it, Joaquin into, uh, into Nazca is already 19 points, but with that it becomes 23. A 23 point play with just one card is, which could be more if you have spy engines, is just really rare. So he missed out on that, and now Azir, I, I don't know what kind of value Azir can go for here. I mean, does it get over the hump here? Jorah's got six points. Freddy Babes has 47 <laughs> points. He's holding Commander's Horn in his hand. Plus, he has Margarita, just in case anything gets boosted from uh, Joaquim. It's looking pretty good for Freddy in this matchup. I mean, and it's, 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 he, he did not ban Nilfgaard because he was prepared for it, and that's really how it looks right now. Excellent placement with Joaquim there, making sure that one of these spies gets buffed by the Commander Horn. So this makes it so that what, what this does is, oh, wait, I just go for the tower here, right? Or you can just ban one of those. It's, just, it's the same thing. No, it's actually more value if you do that. That's, that's six, and if you, no, no, it's less, 
It's less, but he okay. wants to target that with, uh, oh man, and Margarita getting that nice 16 point value for Freddy. Freddy with a 41 point lead over Jora. Mm -hmm. Jora has still a lot of cards to play, but Freddy has that Commander's Horn and the Marching Orders, which will pull. The, if I believe a Reaver Scout is still available to uh, Freddy at this point. Has he not played a Reaver Scout yet? I am, uh, I would have to, I... <laughs> Otherwise it's Death Mold, basically. It's possible that it happened in a different game, but I just, all, I, all I'm focusing on right now is Freddy Babes nodding. I think he knows that no matter what Jorah has, it's not going to be enough. It came in me. There it is, the Nausicaa Brigade. I'm not sure why I didn't burn the Emissary, though. Oh, because he wants to play Azir. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, that is Azir it. does get him that little bit extra. You it is Death Mold. It is Death Mold. Death Mold, right. Death Mold on to the Nausicaa Brigade for the maximum value. Peter has already been played, so it's not like you can be worried about Peter resetting uh, it back and I it again. As this here goes down, I'm gonna return Roach back to Jorah's deck, and it, it'll be to see what he opts to return on top of that. Like if he just goes for Roach, or if he tries to disrupt uh, his opponent's potential Dextra. We'll, we'll see. We'll see what he goes for here. But Jorah is really far behind and is lacking some engine here. I, I think I think you may you may go Kalek. I mean, I mean I mean I think there was no reason not to play Kalek there because if you pull Kalek with uh, no, no, no never mind. Never mind. He doesn't have any way. Yeah. yeah. And also that's Freddy was wrote. able to apply that yeah. commander sword. That's all she wrote. That's gonna be it. That's that's it. Jora with taking down the loss and Freddy goes two to one, losing the first game but getting double straightforward victories of uh, consecutive sorry English. Yeah. Double consecutive victory over Jora's Emir spies, considered to be one of the most powerful decks in the current metagame. Freddy has been able to shut it down and is giving us a good reason as to why he chose Hensel as a ban over Emir. Really just a solid execution against uh, Nilfgaard spies and, uh, you know, just applying control when necessary. Uh, just having a lot of the right cards in the right moment, but that all happens on the deck building screen, especially when it comes to the picks and bans. So we're going to get to see Freddy Babes taking his final deck here to go for match point, punching his ticket perhaps to the semifinals, and uh, we're going to find out if that's going to happen. Croc on Crate Cursed Skellige is going to be Freddy's final deck that's going to go in, and we're going to see if Jorah is going to take another stab at it with Nilfgaard, or if he's going to have to take his monster's deck back into the fray. You spoiled it, man. I was trying not to spoil it. <laughs> Just kidding. Yeah, oh. Cursed, Cursed, it is the only Cursed deck. Uh, that we've seen up until now, because both croc lists that we see prior are oh oh look at oh, <laughs> oh, oh, hey, hey, hey. Yeah, he's got a knife he's got a knife don't don't, don't mess with knife Magua, you I know, know I know a that, thing or two about knives yeah <laughs> I do as we see Jorah really contemplated there he's one loss away from getting eliminated and Freddy is one win away from reaching the semifinals Freddy has been able to take down Emir twice in a row now there has been some unfortunate draws by Jorah but also perhaps some missequencing or some really early passes that have left him vulnerable to that because even though he was able to preserve that card over Freddy, it was nowhere near enough. That Cantrella was like extra points and he just did not get the proper uh, momentum going on for him as, as Freddy just really capitalized on that late game and <laughs> had such a monstrous lead over him. In crazy. both of those games, Freddy just ran him through, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like yep. the, monsters, yep. the monsters, the gaps that we saw, the disparity in points that we saw in both of those games were huge at any given time. And Freddy's a very aggressive player. He'll push. He'll push really, really hard, and he he obviously takes really good passes. He, third time's a charm, perhaps, for Jorah, taking Nilfgaard in. Now back on the blue coin. Freddy gets to go second here with Chris Skellige. And uh, Chris Skellige making his first appearance here at Gwen Challenger. And, uh, you know, it's a pretty strong list. This list that Freddy believes in. There's a lot of options for Skellige. Of course, you can make discard Bran. Uh, of course, you can take in Greatsword. We've seen two Greatsword lists already. And now finally, uh, we're getting to see a little bit of Curse Skellige. Very nice mulligans there by Jorah, not getting overly greedy and going back on the last mulligan. He was trying to mulligan away one of the Impair Brigades to improve his hand a little bit. But you know what can happen. You know what's going to happen. Roach is going to happen. And, yeah. Uh, he, he wanted to avoid that and make sure that he actually gets some rain farm value this time around. Yay! He's he going to pull it. Roach and he can actually can throw up potentially. But he's going to opt to lead off with the Impair Brigade. Now, Vic of Medics are rather important in this matchup as they can disrupt Go the uh, resurrection Kazan. team from Skellige. So it's going to be interesting to see if he decides to use them to chain spies or to potentially deny something like a restore on a battle maiden or stuff like that because it's uh, when it comes to curse skellige the restore targets are a little bit more limited than for example Come to get you. yeah you're looking for uh hey May battle maiden in most situations mm -hmm. uh but uh we're looking at freddie babe's hand here you do see 
four of the silvers uh, that he has available to him. The remaining silvers that we don't see, Olgird being one of them, and uh, we do see Skjall, but we don't see Gremis. Mm -hmm. And then we don't see any of the golds in Freddy Babe's hand. He is rocking Madman Lugos, Coral, Royal Decree, and Muzzle, all buried in 15, the 15 remaining cards in his deck. Now, Curse Skellige, for those of you who knew who are watching, is a very cool archetype. It also runs around Crack, but it's very different from Great Swords. Uh, this deck focuses on snowballing turns. It actually has the potential of, of capitalizing on a relatively long round, but it doesn't necessarily build up as strong for... As good as okay, MSA, okay. Uh, Kalak into uh, Assassin to deny uh, potentially a Battle Maiden onto the Raging Berserker. Uh, you know, that's a pretty decent approach, especially considering that, you know, Enforcers doesn't work against Ranging Berserker because most top players don't really agree with Kalak onto Assassin, but in this particular Come scenario, uh, if you go with the Enforcer and you ping it, then it will transform into a bear and then you just have to start all over again and taking it down. So, I, I, I can agree with that play. And as I was saying, Curse Skellige is a deck that can actually snowball quite a bit because it tries to build up the board mm. with uh, cursed units and also self wound them with the aid of cards like Clan Borkbark Archer. And then finish off around with the Berserker Marauder, which is a very powerful unit to go for. But no Herald Hound Snout uh, in Freddy Babe's lineup here for this deck, which makes me a little bit sad because that's one of my favorite cards in Skellige right now. I think a lot of players are cutting Herald Hound Snout lately because uh, he's he's fairly simple to play around. A lot of there a lot of decks have options to do it. Of course, the uh, the, the enforcers are one of those ways, just to ping off the skulls, make them a little bit less threatening, of course. It looks like, look at this, he's playing another assassin on the young berserker. He's really trying to deny that. I think Freddy Babes is totally fine with that. I, I, I have a feeling that this is like, Kalok has so much potential to be so good with Nilfgaard with the emissaries, emissary chains, being able to source the enforcers, be able to thin the deck, make everything very efficient. Jorah's saying no to all of that, just to assassinate those bears. But I, I mean, he has the option to get uh, still get one more bear potentially. Uh, no Freya's in hand for Freddy, but he is running three of them uh, in this case, but uh, not making that choice here. Just going ahead and playing Croc on Crate uh, to get old here sir. in this situation, which is the highest unit in the deck. There is no Genja Fret or anything like that. Now, the question is, is, oh, is shame, Freddy I truly no okay time. with this? Because, Next yes, you don't tend to see um, Assassin being played by Nilfgaard because the, the Emissary Chain to Enforcer tends to be more efficient. But in this particular case, you are weakening the Marauders. You're stopping the uh, Chains with the Battle Maiden. You're basically, like in this matchup, you want your opponent to have at le the least amount of Curse units on the board as possible. And on top of that, you have double Emissary in hand, Kalak again to be reutilized, and a Vico Varo Medic. So you can still pull off some very nasty chains, even potentially resort to Rainfarn if you want to, to get another Emissary. Like, I feel like he has enough tools to cycle through his deck. So I actually think that in this particular scenario, the Assassins are pretty clever. I like him. Yeah, fair point, Miguel. I mean, you do know a little bit more about Nilfgaard in this situation. That is Nile of a lot of mechanics here. You know, the Heimei Battle Maiden doesn't really have a target. With no Frey, you're not going to get that. You're, you're not going to get that uh, uh, Young Berserker, but he does roll the dice there and gets that last Berserker from Skjall that wasn't to guarantee in this situation. So now he will potentially get, you know, you get the big bears in the graveyard. One of the things that Skellica does so well in the Cursed Archetype is each play has the potential to be stronger than the last play. The longer the round goes, the better the Berserkers are. But even in a short round, Skellica is always good in a short round because of what they a can shame resurrect. I, have no I, like, I like the fact that he's not opting to uh, assassin that Raging Berserker because the threat of the Clan Heimei Battle Maiden is gone. That is the last Raging Berserker of the deck. So he no longer has to worry about him chaining those and him targeting it. So now, yes, he can potentially hit it with the Archer, but that's not that crazy of a play if you think about it. So Jora is in a very, very solid spot here as he's going to drop the second Enforcer, and we're going to see the power of the Nifgardian Spy Engine. Double Enforcer and a Brigade that is sitting at 16 strength, and the Enforcer is just absolutely shredding everything in its way. Yeah, Freddy has a pretty big point gap to make up here. He hasn't played Morkvarg yet. It may be something that he may consider doing. Uh, he also can activate the bear with the archer, but with a point gap like this, a pass is also a consideration. Definitely is, especially considering that you're one card over your opponent, but Jorah has yet to play Cantrilla, so he becomes vulnerable, especially like in this kind of matchup, if you By give Nilfgaard the, uh, the, the control here, it, it can get a little bit nasty. But also something very important is that in a Nifgardian uh, Skellige matchup, if Nilfgaard loses round one, sometimes it's in their interest to do so because they have first say in round three. 
as they're forced to go first, and thus they can play the Vicavara Medic to take away uh, potential resurrection from the opponent before they can resurrect it themselves. So mm. it's w one of the few matches in which like Nilfgaard actually does not mind as much like going down minus one if, of course, oh, sorry, losing round one if, of course, you're forcing some extra cards out of your opponent in the process. As Kalex is going to go down, and yeah. this time, this time, for those of you who are getting shame, triggered by Double no Assassin, time. no worries. Here comes the regular <laughs> standard play. Emissary into the last Enforcer, and if I if, if, if Freddy doesn't pass here, I just I don't know. Like this is rough. <laughs> it's so hard to fight against three enforcers. Two enforcers bad enough. Three enforcers near impossible. Mm -hmm. So much potential here as Rainfarn is still able to pour, uh, source another disloyal unit on top of that. Vikovara medic can pull another emissary. So that each right, that right there is just 12 passive points that's coming from the uh, the units on the board. In addition to being 20 points down, not so favorable. But Freddy Babe's thinking about establishing Morkvarg for the carryover, but. Is it is you know what would be the ri what would be the risk of playing Morkvark here if even if you were planning on passing? Uh, having being forced to uh, have like a, going down minus one basically like yes the double double carryover is good I think this is still the, the proper play because Freddy you kind of uh, I think he has a better chance if he wins round one with one card he, he, even though cause, because his opponent hasn't played Cantrell he can't really threaten him with that until he plays it so he's yeah. kind of forced to continue playing and he can't These close the gap he can definitely close the gap as both Olgeard and Morkvar count as curse units alongside the bear and Olgeard is also damaged so that Berserker Marauder uh, is not looking to be super strong right now like it's representing 11 strength mm -hmm. in total but he's, he's definitely got the options to do so especially with cards like um the archer or well after that did he have a 12 point play after that is my question well he did have sick right that yeah probably... yeah skial is in the deck his skull is in the graveyard as well yeah, okay. so i mean just that yeah, yeah, just yeah, that yeah, as, yeah, as an example from something i at least can source from my memory yeah. um but as well i mean at this point like joris established the three enforcers freddie Bates plays more for goes behind joris spent this whole round establishing By the, the three enforcers he's not gonna pass hog. he's got so much power in this round so it's possible like I mean, at this point, this is this is a little bit tougher for Freddy Babes to get ahead of here. Yeah, Jora with an 18-point lead. Really debating about whether to pass here and force two cards out of Freddy. That would be very devastating for him. Even though, like, with all that engine, it's kind of very tempting not to because it's... It's, I don't know, but 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 it's such a strong lead that it would force a very like the question is would re, would restore into Scow or Sigrifo into Scow? It's mm. basically the same thing. Would that be enough if he would have to pull a Berserker Marauder? I don't think so. I think he has to go that minus two here. Like I, th I think I think if you're Jory, you take the pass here. Like we're talking about 18 points. He needs a 19 point play. Yeah, that's not possible. It's just too tempting, right? You that's just, not possible. It's just so excellent pass. So much. Yeah, it's, so much. Yeah, I, th I think because because. Unless I'm missing something here. Sigrifa into Skal. Me more John Freya watch us and keep us. I mean, he's gonna get Skal. No, 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 it, 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 it isn't. Nothing. What am I talking about? What am I, of course it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. sorry about that. It's been up by a little bit. I, I forgot to count the uh, the points from Sigrifa. <laughs> I apologize. All right, good. Good for Freddy. That's actually really solid. Being able to steal that round, especially when your opponent has yet to play Cantrilla. Maybe it wasn't that good of a pass then. I mean, it's funny because you said Freddy Babe should pass, right? Freddy Babe should pass against three enforcers, and I was I was right there with you. But I mean, honestly, like the thing Jora had to consider is when Freddy Babe's made that play and was still behind by that many points, did Jora think that that was a bluff in that situation? Because mm -hmm. Freddy going down two cards would have been suicide in that situation. Now the question is, Great why pass here. why didn't he go for restore? And he could have gone for restore, and then potentially resurrected that. Uh, that scow, but which would have been buffed up to eight, right? But the thing is, he probably ran out of cursed units. Yeah, yeah. I'm looking at his deck, and he has nothing left, so he couldn't have been able to afford that. I'm curious to see what that restore is going to target. But we are going to see a Vicar medic here to close the gap and enable uh, Jor to take this in just uh, one play. You can just go for the bear right there. Yep. And now the thing is, they're going uh, they're going to round three with an evil card state. And Jora has a very menacing looking hand. While Freddy does also have options, but I think it's gonna be interesting. Those Marauders can definitely snowball here. Mm -hmm. But he does have Menno. He is able to uh, deny one of them, but he does not have Last Say. And in a third round in which you rely on Menno, when you don't have Last Say, mm -hmm. that makes it very hard to play efficiently, especially against a faction like Skellige, which can just resurrect that unit again. But he does have Rainfarn into Cantarella, so he would get last say, is that not right? 
Yeah, if, if he opts to go for Rain Farm to Cantrell. He's, he's already played all emissaries, correct? So and he has Joachim in hand, so I think that's probably the way. And then but Meta, then again, of course, can knock out Cantarella. So, you know, yeah. it is a very threatening hand from Jora here. But it's still a negative six-point play. Like, it's still... Well, round three, I mean... You're giving your opponent... Um, you're giving your opponent a, a card for free, basically, at the expense of having the last, uh, say, in this match. So it, it's... I shall be Rain Fart kind of takes away from that by, by adding five points to your board, but it's still a little bit devastating. He, he does have components of... He has a, one brigade, but that's all he has left out of his spy engine. So it's hard to say. Like, you know, this Rain Fart, I just... It's been a kind of a liability throughout this entire series, really. I mean, obviously, you would li like Rainfront into Joachim is such a strong play. I mean, Rainfront into Cantarella is is not bad. I mean, it is you're, it is a negative six point play, but spies are always risky, and mm. to, you, you're paying that price to get that last say over your opponent, which you know in Gwent from its inception has always been a very threatening thing. And uh, you know, when you have a card like Menno to protect you a little bit, it does help. Uh, even though you'd probably Freya. like to use your infiltrator to hit something much larger, like perhaps a, a raging berserker later on, as we know that they can get pretty. Pretty big in a semi-long round, they can still do okay work, but there's not a lot of cursed units left here unless they're going to get rezzed. Yeah, well, there I'm, are two I'm, on the board right now. I'm, I'm, I'm just looking right now at, at Jora's options. <laughs> him only having one engine, and him even though like him having to give like control to his opponent here when his opponent can just start uh, snowballing the Marauders, it's definitely. I believe it's looking a little bit rough for Jora here. I, I just want to go back to that rain farm. Like every single match, it just hasn't really done all that great. Like in, in the two prior games, it was forced to. It was it basically provided no value because he ran through all his spies, and now here, like spies in round three are not good. Okay, <laughs> they're not a yeah. good thing. I, I hope I emphasize that enough. So we're gonna see a Vigamaro medic, perhaps. Perhaps trying to deny some of his reses, but instead going for the emissary. He's really debating about debating about it there for a second. As if we not do by see strength, uh, infiltrator by onto the clan board, board archer. Mm. I mean, I like I like picking emissary here because Martin this way he can play the uh, emperor brigade and not have it be no muzzleable insult. because now the emperor brigade drops you it at ten and not at eight, or will drop at twelve at this point. But at, before it was dropping at an eight, which would have been very very risky, uh, as we can see the muzzle. So that could have been a heads up play there. Um, as there are there are a lot of powerful options in Skellig's graveyard. Of course, Vikovar medic being that graveyard hate that Skellig can despise at time. But now he can safely play that hey, emperor brigade. See, both players are now at four cards each, and uh, Jora is 11 points behind. Behold, That's right. not good news when your Who's opponent has such a snowball potential here as the second right? Berserker Marauder hits the board at a, a 13 strength and puts Freddy really ahead. It's, it's not like Mano is representing tremendous value either because his strength is well distributed across the board. It's not focused on one particular point, so it's really really hard to say, especially like what is Vilgefort's going to pull that's really going to benefit him. Yeah, you know, I got my eye on the muzzle right now and I'm wondering if it's actually not crazy to play Gremist into a weather effect just to bring the strength down. Like, is, is there enough rounds here to bring the Emperor Brigade down to eight knowing that Joachim is still going to be procking it once? Just get it at eight to get a perfect muzzle? I, I have don't, to play it next, right? I mean, the difference is why not just go for a fog and, and get like a seven point muzzle? It seems like too much, it means too much, it, it's like too much of a hassle for that as he's going to go for the Infiltrator right oh, here. Oh, of course, the Infiltrator as well. It does make yeah. it impossible. I apologize. I'll take that back. But I mean, it is, it is the only way you can get the ping on. Otherwise, that muzzle is going to get a one point. It's a two point muzzle. It's not nearly good enough. Freddy's in a great position, don't get me wrong. Yeah, no, no, yeah. yeah you want to maximize your card no, but, as much but, as possible. Yeah, but no, don't know what but your he, opponent has. He could, definitely, uh, he could definitely set up the, the Gremist Fog on the Melee Row and uh, work for a 14 point muzzle. But we'll, we'll see. Because right now, as you said, he has no good target for it. And looking at uh, Frey's hand, because Mazo unfortunately cannot target gold cards. Mm -hmm. uh, it's definitely it maybe a little bit of empty value, but even even in that case, Freddy's <sighs> lead is not you again. Super strong here. Yeah. We're gonna see Gremis go down. What will we go for? He's really debating. He's really thinking about it because he can't see the hand like we do. But is he? He is gonna go for the fog onto the melee row. I would assume. Yep, and he's gonna set up that muzzle, indeed. Yeah, I mean, like, what can you put? What can you put Jora on that would be a muzzleable target? I mean, when you haven't seen Joachim, you haven't seen Meno, and you haven't seen Viljaforts, and you've seen all of those cards in previous matchups, only four cards left in the deck. All enforcers are played. The Emperor Brigade would be above six, and the Nausicaa Brigade would come down as a nine. It's actually a fantastic play here, uh, because at least, like, otherwise, muzzle gets, you know, two points again. Not good enough. 
This mana is going to represent 21 points for Jorah, which is going to enable him to catch up to Freddy by two points. And it's going to make this a very interting late game as both Joachim and Vilgoforce represent a lot of power. This is, a, this is a little closer than I thought it would be oh, just a little bit earlier yeah, in the round. That, that, that mana makes things a little bit better, but that fog is also ticking. This is this is very intense, actually. If Freddy Babes, if Freddy Babes manages to pull this off, he will have been able to make a comeback after that first round loss. And uh, Jorah is still not out of it. This is super intense. He has to go... Well, he doesn't have to go for Muzzle now by any means because uh, the uh, the fog is going to proc on the other uh, infiltrator. This is so massive. Oh, oh right? but look at that with the restore. I mean, yeah, as I was saying earlier, like this is... But see, this is what, what is... This is what Chris Skellige does so well. Just pushing a long round. Every play is stronger than the last. Um, unless I'm missing something, like I go back to earlier, why did Freddy not go for Restore on Scow? And then, I, I guess he wasn't sure he wasn't going to go for this play, perhaps. He perhaps he also had the option to go for Grammys if he needed to, so I, I guess that was his uh, thought process there. Because he would have had more value if he actually uh, played Restore first and then Drifa afterwards to resurrect the Scow. But, you know, nonetheless, uh, a very powerful swing as but it's Vilgo Force time. Choice. Well, what are we going to get here? I mean, see. There's only so many things that are left. Azir! Azir! Azir. Azir. Does he... This world mm. dies what options does he have here? Does it even matter? At no, do not, do not return Roach. You do definitely do not want to return Roach here. Uh, as you have no more goals. Oh man, that, that really... Just yeah, a, yeah. He's gonna take it for value. Yep, yeah, just, just a 17 point play there. Fred, as he goes for the 14 point play, Monzo, and here it is, ladies and gentlemen. This is the last play. That does proc the Brigade. Joaquim also crossed the brigade. So close. And he gets Peter! Oh, he gets Peter! It's, he not, it's gonna heal up the infiltrator at least. Is, is, it that, up? is that enough? I strive above no, no, all it, to be just. Oh, just no, it's not, it's not. It barely misses. Ooh. Oh! oh my the dude. fog is gonna be Freddy enough! Freddy Babes takes it and comes oh. back. What a last match. Three to one. <laughs> nice! That's how you want to punch your ticket to the semifinals right there, in style, just that little bit there. Every decision mattered in that in that best of five series. Nilfgaard getting three, uh, sorry, a three-peat from Freddie Babes there, taking out Nilfgaard three times in a row. There's the GG.